All right, Hurley Burleyites of all shapes, sizes, political affiliations, and cryptocurrency preferences, we have a heck of a show for you today. But before we go there, I want to address a comment posted recently in the Infinity Maze that is the Apple Podcast Rating and Review System. It's from Jazz 2K1, a brand new listener to the Hurley Burley. Jazz says of the pod, just discovered and loving it. Love the thoughtful conversations, especially the ones with former prime ministers. I know you were Martin guys, but any chance of an interview with Jean Chrétien? Oh, Jazz. Dear, dear Jazz. (laughs) Thank you for the suggestion. (laughs) But as my 1960s television hero, Mr. Spock, would say, negative, Captain. (laughs) Just take a listen to our back catalog if you want to understand why Mr. Kretschner will not be appearing on the show. All right. Armin Yelnesian is our guest today. Armin is a leading voice on Canada's economy. According to Maclean's magazine, who ranked her 22 on their power list, four slots higher than a certain profane podcast trio that I know, she's the caring person's economist. A big picture thinker who looks out for the little guy. Armin is the coiner of the term... She session way back in March 2020 to describe the economic fallout of the pandemic and is currently the Atkinson Fellow on the Future of Workers. Her mission as a policy thinker and innovator is to bring workers' perspective to the public policy development process and help all of us make sense of what's happening in the economy. These things are precisely what we're going to talk about today. Why do working people deserve a bigger slice of the pie and how do they get it? How will hordes of gig workers ever find security? And what's the role of government in all that? Armin, it's really a pleasure to have you on the Hurley Burley today. Thank you for making time. Oh, you know it's an honor to be on this show. I really appreciate you reaching out. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Tell us a little bit about yourself. Where do you come from? Um, I'm a 100% Armenian uh, to begin with. Uh, I am a feminist from my teens. I am a mother from my 30s, and I've been an economist, I think, almost all my life. Even though my life was guided by music from the time I was five years old, I love the patterns that you see in the interplay between micro and macroeconomics. I love knowing why it is that white men of a certain age get to rule the world because of the way they interpret what economics are. So I have been enjoying my life as an economist more and more so with every passing year, because here we are going through a a pandemic that is global in nature, looking at a war, uh, an invasion of one country by Russia, of Ukraine by Russia, threatening to embroil the world in a different type of relationship with one another. I'm just watching the world change before my eyes. And economics explains almost all of what's going on, along with demographics. I just feel like I'm in my wheelhouse finally at this stage in my life, which is quite advanced. Well, speaking about being in your wheelhouse, I fucking love that room that you <laughs> so are does in. Room Raider. Room Raider thinks right. I'm, I'm better than most economists because of it. <laughs> I, oh my God. I, I would trade anything for that room. For those who can't see, Armin is situated in front of walls of vinyl records. Walls of vinyl records. I have a few vinyl records left from the day, and I like to profile one on this show every uh, every week. And uh, so, you know, you reach behind you and pull out something that you'd like to listen that you'd like to tell us about. What's a record oh, in there well, that matters you to you? Let, let me just take a look because I happen to be sitting in front of the rock section that we have a blues section, a classical section. We have tons of sections here. Um, And by the way, this isn't my collection. That almost got really interesting. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) uh, This isn't my collection. Full disclosure, this is my partner's collection. I am a divester. He is a hoarder. And he has been hoarding since his teens. And uh, we had a long distance relationship for 30 years. So I wasn't in the position to tell him what to get rid of. And when I moved in with him uh, about four years ago, we decided that the music room was probably the best room in the house because of his collection. Absolutely. It's awesome. And I was anticipating this, com- this conversation. So I have at the ready one of my favorite albums. Lou Reed, Walk on the Wild Side. 
killer track, killer track, legendary track. Legendary album, yeah. He yeah. he made me think about the world totally differently. When I first heard it, he was just like nothing else that was out there. And so I have dipped into this well, which goes back, you know, almost half a century now. And it's still fresh, man. It's totally fresh in, in, the, in the issues it addresses and, and the uh, insouciance with which he addresses them. Right. Well, I think that people have learned a lot about us right here and now because <laughs> I have, you know, behind me, my Elton John Caribou album, one of the best-selling albums of all time and certainly a symbol of conformism in musical taste. Um, and uh, somebody Well, uh, Caribous are wild, so he's walking on the wild side too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that anybody ever compared Elton John and, and Lou Reed. You, <laughs> you were obviously looking for a different, more avant-garde experience out of your music. Oh, I don't know. Sometimes you just hear stuff and it's just like, oh, what is that? I need to hear that again. I remember the first time I heard Billie Eilish on the radio and it's like her music was like nobody else's music. Now she's, you know, mainstream. But when she first came out, it's like, what is this sound? Who is creating yeah, this? I and I think that's how Lou Reed hit me in the 70s. Um, OK, we got a lot of stuff to cover today. Yeah, because I don't know if you know, I recently had Seamus O'Regan on the show. Yes, and I, I know. I don't know if you know that, but he's the Minister of Labor. <laughs> I've heard tell. <laughs> and I asked him a bunch of questions, and I'd like to ask you some of the same questions. Ooh, spicy. Well, not really. I mean, I'm just looking to get, you know, I mean, I, you know, from a government perspective, he, you know, is, I think, somewhat limited in what he can contemplate or what he can muse about. And, uh, you know, I'd like to hear somebody that's less compromised in that mm. respect talk about, some, talk about some of these things. Yeah. Um, and I to start just to frame the conversation. I'm really obsessed about the way that the economy has stopped treating working people fairly over the last 30 or 40 years. And the, uh, the fact that the division of economic growth has gone almost exclusively for decades now to people that were already wealthy and not to people that were working. And to me, this is at the bottom of a lot of the weird shit we're seeing in our cultural divisions, in our political behavior, um, is rooted in the economic stagnation of working people. This is my belief. Um, and so I just want to start off by asking you, what is causing this unequal, less equal allocate, it was never equal, but what is causing this less equal division of proceeds that we've been seeing really since the late 70s, early 80s? I bet you can guess I'm going to say it's complicated. Yeah, I'm sure it's very complicated and take the time to walk us through it. Um, okay. Uh, the number one reason is demographics. So the baby boom is, I don't know how old you are, I'm 67, and the baby boom is on its way out, and it has shaped everything about economics since we were born. It's shaped everything about governments since we were born, and it, it, it is across the global north. So across the global north, the thing we didn't have enough of, of in the last half century was money. Show me the money. Everybody wanted to see the money. Um, and so everybody was chasing export-led growth and foreign direct investment and making themselves as uh, attractive to rich people as possible. That has been the, the lodestar. This is the North Star of public policy is how do you grow a bigger economic pie? And it's measured in money. And that money is measured in like how fast it grows is measured by how much investment you can get. The reason we could talk about it that way is we've had a labor surplus for 40 years. So if you will recall that going back to the summer of 2019, we were looking at unemployment rates we hadn't seen in 50 years. Um, and that's going to continue for the next 20 years. So number one story about economics throughout the global north that is all going through population aging at the same time and competing with one another 
to get the newcomers we're going to need because we don't have enough young ones to replace the ones. We don't have enough people entering the labor market to replace the people who are exiting because of declining birth rates for decades. Right. And that, as I said, is happening around the world. We're getting our first inversion of the normal economic uh, framework of growing an economic pie, which is more money. Um, and secondly, labor surpluses. Now we've got, we're awash in money and we can't find people to do the job. Let me give you a very concrete example. In 2021, mid, mid-pandemic, Canada broke its records on attracting venture capital. $12.3 billion came into the country in 2021. A quarter of that money went to one consortium of companies who's, who are headquartered in Waterloo, in the Kitchener-Waterloo area, because they're tech companies. Kitchener-Waterloo closed childcare centers to be able to pay for their policing. They can't attract enough workers to do the job. They have all the money in the world, but they can't find the people because they don't have the services. So this leads me to um, the second issue about inequality, growing inequality, and who's getting away with all the money? Who's, who's grabbing all the money? Since 2010, David, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, all these mainstream big, big player uh, organizations have been calling for what? growth, but inclusive growth. They added that silly little adjective, inclusive. They didn't just define what inclusive meant, but what it really meant was less inequality. If you're going to grow, don't just let all the money flow to the top. Actually make it trickle down or figure out a way of getting it from the bottom up. Like do something about the bottom. So that goes to your point about why haven't we seen wage increases? So number one reason is labor surplus. We've gone from 40 years of having too many workers. Let me remind you also, I'm in that age group that it's the biggest cohort entering the labor market in our history because of birth rates in the 50s and 60s. But double it because people like me think we're just as good as men. And we're the first generation of women to think anything you can do, I can do just as well. So we doubled the influx of people right at a time where the first and second oil price shocks were coming in, right? So you're, you've got this like long hangover on workers trying to catch up with inflation, which is much more rapid than it is now. More workers looking for work than we've ever seen before. And yes, the labor market's sucking it up. They're expanding faster than anything we've ever seen, but it's not enough for the size of the cohort that's coming in. Um, and so you're seeing some people able to negotiate better and some people not being able to negotiate better and falling behind. And that is the beginning, of course, as the labor minister mentioned in your interview, we get to 1981 and Reagan and the beginning of the anti-union movement that lasts for decades and culminates with Bill 377 at the federal level under Harper. Like we're talking about 2013, 2014, maybe it was 2015, trying to stop unions from doing their unioning you know, by tying them up in red tape. I think that was like the height of irony is we want to cut red tape for everybody except unions. We want to have a lot more red tape for them, right? That's what 377 was, actually invading your privacy. Uh, being able to look at every member uh, within your union in ways that you would never do for any other group in society. A anyway, the liberals in the Senate killed that bill, um, ironically. Um, and um, we, we didn't have to face that. But around the world, there has been an anti-union push, too, that started in 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 the wake of the oil price shocks, where workers were trying to catch up with inflation. And the ones that were most successful were union workers because they were sitting at a table with their bosses and saying, you're making more money and we're not, we can't even keep up with where we were before and we're helping you make more money. Give us the money, right? So that became an anti-union thing that, ha that has lasted for 30, 35 years. So I've mentioned demographics, in particular, switching from labor surplus now to labor shortages, which threaten another, like they seem to threaten another spiral of wage inflation that we're not seeing it yet, but that's the fear amongst the people that were economic analysts for the last 40 years. They're warning us, don't let wage inflation get out of control. It's nowhere near out of control, but 
that's a story. And so there's inflation, there's uh, demographics, and there's public policy that have, uh, and the public policy part is not just anti-union and wage suppression. We, we also went through a bout of wage and price control, but which was actually mostly wages. <laughs> You know, like in 1974, I think it was uh, Stanfield that asked for wage and price control, like months after the oil price shock. Trudeau said, nah, not happening. And then zap, you're frozen. He introduced it in 1975. It lasted till 1979. And then it was brought back in 1982 only for public servants. Where have we seen this movie before? Right. So it was mostly wage freezes, not price freezes. But in those instances, we also had um, price review boards and laws as well as tax policies to tax excess profits and to review uh, profiteering. And we can get into that later. We don't have any of that now. We still are living with the hangover of show me the money, bring me the money. Uh, we are looking at the way we compete for international investments and getting foreign, develop, uh, foreign direct investment into the country is to lower our tax regime. So we've been looking at tax cuts, as you will know, <laughs> from the work that you have done. We've been, you know, the year 2000 was Chrétien and Martin out tax cutting Preston Manning. That, that, that was the major thing. We, we cut programs like crazy in 1995 to get rid of the deficit that turned into a surplus three years ahead of time. We built up a surprise surplus year after year after year, headed into an election. And what we did with the surplus was out tax cut Preston Manning. And ever since then, Every jurisdiction, well, around that same time, every jurisdiction wanted to attract the money by cutting taxes. When you cut taxes, who wins? The rich, right? They're the ones that pay the most taxes if you cut taxes. Now, mind you, at the end of the Second World War, when they cut taxes, they cut taxes only for the poor. So there's lots of different ways you can design tax cuts. It isn't only that way, but that's what we've been doing since the 1990s is cutting taxes for those who pay them, by and large, those are the rich. So the people that have benefited most from this tax cut era have been the rich. So they win both in terms of how they negotiate at the top, and they win in terms of how much they keep from government. And that whole array of things is just starting to flip right now, where we're talking about more progressive taxes at the top. We're talking about providing more public services for everyone, which helps the people at the bottom the most. And we are talking about raising minimum wages and other ways to improve bargaining power for those who should be feeling more bargaining power right now. We are at the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years. We are facing When you say we're talking about raising to the top marginal rate, who's talking about that? Well, we have- Because the people uh, I know who pay the top marginal rate think it's already what they would describe as confiscatory. Too high. Yeah, it's yeah, over yeah. 50% and therefore it's not taxation anymore. It's confiscation. Is what well, okay. Think. Let's be absolutely clear. We're talking about a combined marginal rate of over 50% on incomes over what? $250,000. It isn't on all your income. It's on the income you are earning over that, right? So the, our, the idea of confiscatory rates uh, is not on all your income. It's on over a certain amount of income. So let's be clear on that. Secondly, um, it's true that the way we're talking about it now is on corporate profits rather than on personal incomes. And the fact that some corporations have done extremely well during the pandemic and are not paying, they're paying the same rate, uh, but they have lots of tax dodges. So uh, trying to actually get them to lean in a little bit harder to help with the costs of the pandemic because they benefited so much. Uh, so that's the progressivity in the corporate tax system. And we are looking at surtaxes. We're not looking at permanent increases in rates. Uh, we are looking at temporary surtaxes, but people are talking about progressivity again. Out there in corporate Canada, there are meaningful behaviors that make our country and world a better place. And then there are just words, the signaling of virtue without the actions necessary to make any real change. For a few weeks now, we've been telling the story of TELUS's ESG commitments, environmental, social, and governance. TELUS is a company driven by social purpose, 
not because it's fashionable in this third decade of the 2000s, but right from their inception, to use their world-leading technology in a way that's not only good for business, but good for people and the world, across healthcare and agriculture, sustainability, bridging the digital divide to ensure that all Canadians have connectivity. They put the well-being of their customers, communities, and the planet first. It all sounds so nice, right? But let me tell you how TELUS governs themselves so that those nice-sounding words become actions. Theirs is a culture of what gets measured gets done. ESG targets are built right into how they evaluate their corporate performance. Environmental initiatives, measured and reported on. Carbon reduction, measured and reported on. Community giving, measured and reported on. The list goes on and on, hurly burlyites. That's how seriously TELUS takes ESG reporting. And the result is it drives accountability. It turns their values into behaviors. And it's not just private reporting either. TELUS, as you know, is a public company. Transparent disclosure of financial performance is a given. What separates TELUS is that they also believe in full disclosure of their performance across all ESG metrics and how they make their decisions about where to put their efforts and their money around environmental and social sustainability. Transparency means you can read all about it here in their sustainability and ESG report at telus.com slash sustainability. But Armin, do we not already have a disparity in the tax system? And it puzzles me why we would. It, do we not tax labor income more mm-hmm. onerously than investment income? Oh, yeah. Right? So if you make your money working eight hours a day, you're going to pay a higher rate of tax than if you make your money investing in the market and growing your wealth. Why would that possibly be? What's the rationale for that? Uh, this goes back to the comment I was making about show me the money. Let me let me have more money. So in 1987, Mulroney cut the capital gains inclusion under the expectation that if we cut taxation on capital gains, more people would want to invest in Canada. It didn't happen. But we cut our taxation rate of inclusion from 75% of all your capital gains get taxed to 50%. And we're still there. And we've done this a couple of times now where we raise the inclusion rate, we drop the inclusion rate, we try and make it more fair. We really do want to attract your investment dollars. So we're not going to tax you at 100%. But what, what share of your capital gains should we tax? That goes up and down. And what we have seen is the secular drop in investment, both business investment and foreign investment over, uh, no, no, I, I can't speak to foreign investment. I think there's been an increase in foreign investment. But in, in, in business investment, a secular drop in business investment in physical stuff, though probably an increase in um, intellectual, uh, you know, cerebral AI and that sort of thing, data. Um, and Geez, I lost the track of my own thinking. Oh yeah, we've 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 lost uh, we've lost business investment and productivity, and the two things were supposed to be like you invest more, you become more productive. The pie grows faster. The economic pie grows faster. By the way, I hate the pie analogy. I think we're building a cake, but we can get to that some other time. You can fight that out with Belinda Stronach sometime. But yeah, right I am. On. <laughs> <laughs> But would I mean, doesn't this isn't this taxation policy exacerbating the core problem? Because my understanding is that the real issues of inequality now are not between high income earners and lower income earners. It's between people with wealth and people without wealth. If you have money, you're making money. And if you don't have money, you're not making money. Unless you're a tech bro and you're investing in crypto. You right. have money, right. you're investing it, you're losing it. <laughs> So, I mean, just out of fairness, why wouldn't we why, why wouldn't we be taxing wealth in order to redistribute it a little bit? I mean, you raise a really good point. And I think that is historically the big story. But I think the big story now, David, is making every job a good job. That's what we've got like right in our reach. Instead of working on redistribution, we should be working on predistribution. 
of uh, well-being. And we can do that both through how we pay people and the wages and working conditions of all jobs, which we should be doing, right? The labor market is is tightening. It's an opportunity. Wait a second. I don't even understand what you said. I don't even understand what you said. Make every job a good job. (laughs) Aren't we going exactly in the opposite direction of that? Oh, Isn't the quality of our jobs diminishing all the time? Um, I mean, aren't more people working in lower paying, less security work than it? No. No. So we're starting to see an increase in the share of people that work in low wage jobs, though Canada has always been uh, vying for first place in the world in terms of the share of the job market that is low paid with the United States. And every once in a while we we pull up ahead and most of the time they pull up ahead. But like it's been going back and forth for decades now. But we're seeing the share of low wage jobs dropping because we're actually starting to pay low low wage workers a little bit better. Number one. Number two, uh, we are starting to see the role of the care economy as vital. And so much of the care economy is really well paid, nurses and doctors, but some, so much of the care economy uh, and teachers, but so much of the care economy is also riddled with poorly paid people. And we are starting to focus attention on this. My fear is that we are going to snatch defeat out of the jaws of victory because of demographics, because Employers are saying, I can't find Canadians to do the job, in parentheses, at these wages. Right. And we need temporary foreign workers. And if we do what the federal government has been doing for the last six months, first in Quebec in August, and just a few weeks ago for the rest of the country, opening the floodgates for temporary foreign workers to work in the care industry, to work in agriculture, to work in fish plants, we are perpetually suppressing wage growth. That's nuts. Well, is it nuts? I guess I com- I guess I'm also sympathetic to owners who are operating on margins and to seniors. One in four of us is going to be over the age of 65 pretty soon. And when you get that size of a, a an of your population on fixed and lower incomes, they can't tolerate inflation. So there is a limit to how much you can raise wages, but you can actually improve jobs to your point, improve the quality of jobs by making scheduling better and to, you know, have more benefits when you're working um, as well as improving wages. So at least the bottom is getting a living wage. That's not going to upset uh, everybody, but it's going to close the gap between the bottom and the top more than it is right now. So you raised an issue I want to talk about, and it's really awkward to talk about it without sounding like a racist, which I don't think I am. But it's this. It's that there's no more established truism in Canada than that immigration is good for our country and immigration is good for our economy. And so we are letting in half a million people a year uh, into the country, and <clears throat> that is supposed to be good for our economy. And maybe it's good for the overall GDP, and maybe it's good for employers. But how is it not bad for employees? How does that not suppress the wages of the people that already live in the country? If you're adding in 500,000 competitors every year, people who are going to be going after entry-level positions, how does that not hurt people at the lowest end of the spectrum? Wow, what a a ball of wax here. So I'm going to try and unpack this a little bit. We let in 400 and some odd thousand um, permanent residents who are called immigrants. And when we talk about letting newcomers in, we almost always talk about immigrants as if nothing else is happening. But for every single permanent resident we permit to come into the country, we let in two temporary residents, almost all of whom can work. And that's the issue. We let in over 1.2 million people in uh, 2021, which was a pandemic. We let in 1.2 million people that year. Two-thirds of whom, sorry, yeah, two-thirds of whom were uh, temporary residents. That's international students. That's people under the Temporary Foreign Worker Program. That's people through uh, a myriad of programs that are under the umbrella called international mobility programs, which have no uh, work permit that's tied to an employer. 
the temporary foreign worker program, you're tied to that employer when you come in. International students also can work if they're post-secondary automatically. They can work 20 hours a week while they're in full-time classes and they can work full-time when classes are out. And we've got refugees, some of whom get work permits and some of whom don't. Uh, so we are let, bringing in oh, a lot more than 400 half a... And, and, shitload. I almost heard shitload, yeah, yeah, Armin. I didn't say it, though. <laughs> did I? No. Pretty good. Came close. Um, <laughs> But uh, the issue is, number one, we do, <laughs> we're bringing all these people in because employers are saying they can't find Canadians to do it, but we're not letting them stay. Most of them can't stay. Most of them can't stay, David. If you have a single policy that, sa that says, let's suppress wages, let's make it harder for people who are here looking for work to see any growth in their economic pie, that is the policy. You are adding churn to the labor market. Every time you add churn to a labor market, you make it more unstable. You make it harder to ask for better. And you raise costs for employers too. You make it more expensive to recruit and more expensive to retain and more expensive to train because you're training more frequently. So everybody says they want temporary, all the employers say they want temporary foreign workers because they can't find people for these primarily jobs that some Canadians won't do at any price, but most Canadians would do at some price and they don't right. want to pay those wages because um, Canadians did those jobs uh, previously. So the question becomes like farming, can you build the future. You're talking about farming, farming, right? fish plants, tree planting. Yeah. Do you remember how, I mean, I, I'm just looking at you. I don't know how old you are, but in my generation, a great job was planting trees. I mean, you were eaten alive by bugs, but men, you made so much money planting trees. You know, they, they haven't raised the wages for that for ages. So, you know, mushroom pickers used to make $60,000 a year. That was too expensive for Loblaws who wanted to be able to offer mushrooms at $2.99 a pound. So they pressured mushroom growers to have, you know, cheaper wages. And they did it by bringing in temporary foreign workers. I mean, it's garbage. Mushrooms are not temporary. They are year-round products. And we are paying people less now than we were Forget about raising wages. We're paying people less now to do the same job because of pressures from retailers. So we have a really clear path ahead of us in terms of public policy on how not only to build the future of the labor market, but how to build the future of the country. You don't build a country on the backs of temporary foreign workers. Yes, you want to meet business needs. 100% you want to meet business needs. There are legitimate reasons to bring in temporary foreign workers, but you also need pathways to permanence. And you cannot build a country, a society, even a, an economy just because of business interests, because they will always lead you down the path of cheaper labor. Right. Right. So, dear listeners, I want to talk about green. It's a thing nowadays, in case you've tuned out. And about the greenest thing you can do is plant a tree. You know, restore the planet's lungs. Concerned people do it every day, and our sponsor, CN, is alongside them, helping. CN runs a program called Eco Connections, along with its partners, Tree Canada and America in Bloom. The objective is mass reforestation of communities and First Nations along its network in Canada and the U.S. Since 2012, CN and its partners have planted more than 2.3 million trees, which makes CN one of the leading private non-forestry tree planters. The railway runs through national parks, wetlands, forests, and prairies, and CN is serious about preserving them. It's more than that, of course. CN's greening policies are vast. Rail is the greenest form of cargo transport extant. That's it. That's all. Think about it. One train can take hundreds of tractor trailers off our highways. Trains don't stop at traffic lights and have minimal rolling resistance. Compared to big rig trucks or jet aircraft, a train is practically a Prius. Yes, locomotives use fossil fuel, but CN works relentlessly on reducing its carbon footprint, which has already shrunk pretty dramatically over the past several years. CN consumes about 15% less fuel per gross ton mile than the industry average. Among the big Class 1 North American railroads, CN is the most fuel and carbon efficient of all. 
That's a really big deal. There are corollaries to this equation too. Some of the most environmentally friendly products made move from factory to customer by train. CN trains have for years moved wind turbines from factories in Maritime Canada to wind farms in Texas. The latest electric vehicles and solar panels and high capacity batteries, they all arrive by train. CN has used technology to reduce emissions at its yards and other facilities. Ultimately, CN hopes to someday stop using even diesel. It has purchased a fleet of electric trucks to carry out last mile deliveries and has commissioned a prototype electric locomotive. Yes, that's right. Really, really big battery. CN, you see, is the railway of the future. And green is where we all want to go. Um, okay. So, let's talk about unions. Which were okay. a big thing when I... I'm, to answer your twice-asked question now, I will be 60 years old in one month and one day. Muzzle tough. Thank you very much. Uh, it'll be a big celebration. I'll guarantee you that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <I bet. laughs> yeah, fuck. 60. Feel it in every way. Um, but when I was a kid, unions were still a big deal. And in fact, in high school economics, we were taught that Canada had a mixed economy. And we learned as much about the union movement as we did about uh, the capitalist players. Um, and over the course of my lifetime, private sector unionization has almost died. Um, it's still pretty strong in the public sector, but in the private sector, it's largely disappeared and is, you know, you know, sometimes you hear about a role that Jerry Diaz at Unifor would play in bringing a, an auto deal or something, but largely the unions are not a big part of the topic of conversation about the Canadian economy anymore. And it seems to me like they're generally considered to be an artifact of the past. Do you think that Canadians would be better off if we had more private sector union coverage. We are seeing it. We're seeing it in real time in the United States and what happens in the U.S. usually comes over here. We're seeing young people organizing for better wages and working conditions. We're seeing gig workers saying we are employees. We're seeing it in the courts. We're seeing it everywhere. That the demographic pressures that I opened with are saying, uh, are, are forcing people to realize that they have more bargaining power than they have had in 40 years. And we can't find enough people to pour our coffee, to park our cars, to, you know, to do our dry cleaning, to do all of the, like people are starting to become valuable. People like early childhood educators, we just had a breakthrough in public policy after 50 years of asking for a national approach to childcare so that women could deploy their talents. We finally got it. And we pay in Ontario child care workers just above the minimum wage. In some cases, when you go on the website, indeed, pet groomers get paid more than child care workers. So we are reevaluating. They get bit more as well. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. They get sick more too. <laughs> and we still don't have 10 paid sick days after two years of a pandemic and counting. My, my point here is people are starting to or self-organize. But do I think unions are a good thing? You know what I think is a great thing is more dialogue. The thing about unions is it forced business to the table because you were in a long-term relationship. That's interesting. And if you talk to one another, you hear one another. That's why the ILO talked about a tripartite system where government, business, and labor I mean, Seamus O'Regan was talking about that in Ireland, right? When he was talking to you about that, the idea of sectoral councils, the idea that um, you can do better when you talk to one another. Closer to the German model? Uh, well, the, the German model is corporatist, as Seamus said, um, as the minister said, sorry, um, is a corporatist model. It goes back to the Second World War, but Ireland's is more recent. And in fact, Newfoundland and Labrador was one of the only jurisdictions in Canada to have a tripartite table um, for labor issues under uh, Danny. Uh, Danny Williams. Williams. Sorry, I, I, I blanked on his name. Um, actually, the tripartite councils were set up before him, but he really made them work and it fell apart afterwards. But the more we listen to one another, 
the more we learn from one another. And that's what brings us to stable results, things that we can all live with. And the idea that people that make a lot of money that are in business don't need to talk to their workers is a relic from the past. How we end up talking to one another, I don't know. But the answer is not, I don't need to talk to you. Kind of feels that way. I don't get the impression that Elon Musk is that interested in what the average Tesla employee has to say. Yeah, well, I don't, I mean, I, I think you're right. I think that's the, if you're looking for a solution for how to fix things, start talking to one another. If you want things to keep going the direction they're in, stay in your bunkers. So, right. you know, you're, you're raising a really good point, actually, that those who have power are increasingly not talking to people. I was really struck that Steve Pakin wrote a, a, a piece yesterday um, on TV, TVO's blog site. TVO is the public broadcaster in Ontario that does in-depth, the only show in the country that does in-depth political, uh, other than you. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> he's been doing it for five decades. I know yeah, he's been know. doing it for a long time, but he's been doing it for five decades. And he said in his blog for the first time in five decades, we have a premier that refused to be interviewed at any point in his incumbency or even on the campaign trail. The idea that I don't need to talk to you, you I will tell you what you need to know, is a new thing. And I think uh, you're seeing it in signs of autocracies springing up everywhere around the world. I think people with power feel like they don't have to explain themselves to anybody. And I think... That's going to be challenged. I mean, we're seeing so many um, inversions of paradigms I've lived with. You know, when Trump said drain the swamp and he didn't drain the swamp, he was certainly tapping. No, oh, he was certainly tapping in. Can you hear me? OK. Yeah. OK. Um, he was certainly tapping into a sentiment, an anti-establishment sentiment we haven't seen since the 1960s. And it is sweeping the world because the establishment is tone deaf. The establishment is not listening to what people need and want, legitimate needs and wants, not just whining. Um, so I think the more you can open up pathways of dialogue, the stronger, the more resilient your economy becomes. Okay, so doesn't sound like you're ringing endorsement of unions. And, you know, I, I, was, oh, sort yeah. of, I was sort of wondering myself. Can, I mean, no, wait, can I, can I back up then? Because yeah. um, we only have so many democratic pathways to discourse. We have it through our elected governments. And through the process of electing governments, we have a chance to talk to one another and listen to one another. When they're in power, less so, but still some pathways for defining policy through governments in a democratic way. We used to have it through uh, faith organizations, whether they were churches, synagogues, or mosques, there was a way of speaking to your leader in a church about your concerns, having your voice heard, having a two-way conversation, not a one-way conversation. Right. I don't know that that's the case for very many people anymore. And we used to have it through unions. Those are the only institutions. And some, some unions like steelworkers is actually more democratic than any political party. They've got locals from coast to coast to coast. Um, Otto is more located in southern, you know, central Canada. Uh, sometimes unions can be the voice uh, for people, but they don't see themselves that way. They don't talk to their own members enough, right? They, once you get elected, it's almost like, okay, now we're going to tell you what to do. It's a very top-down type of decision-making process, even though, you know, when you enter negotiations, you have to canvas your members. Replacing one boss an with under, another. It's an underutilized mechanism for democratic dialogue. Um, so whereas I think it's hugely promising, I think it's underutilized in its promise. Okay. So, I mean, a lot of people in the economy, whether they were even, let's assume it was entirely desirable. A lot of workers in the economy now seem very difficult to organize. This whole category of gig workers, mm. which, by the way, I'd like your take on whether we should allow this contract designation to continue to occur mm. or whether these people are, in fact, employees who are getting ripped off out of benefits and other security measures. Um, 
So, I mean, what is the role of government in putting in place, and you know, I'm influenced obviously by what Kathleen Wynne tried to do uh, in her term in office. What is the role of government in putting in place the things we used to look to unions to do for their members? Number of sick days you get, number of personal days off, number of vacation days you get, uh, whether you're entitled to a pension, um, you know, what your benefit program is. Um, what's the role for government in creating that kind of security um, umbrella for people? It's huge because the best benefits are portable benefits. It reduces costs for employers, which is what employers always want. It improves resilience of workers and makes them easier to find a good match with an employer, irrespective of what the the benefits are of a particular job. You can do the job because you've got your benefits in your back pocket. You don't need your employer for the benefits. You can focus on the job. So having great portable benefits is like we haven't done much in that regard for about 70 years. And in fact, we cut benefits like EI, what used to be UI, turned it into EI with four rounds of reforms in the early 30s. We're only just now talking about a new round of consultations to modernize EI. I love the fact, though, that you at least use the euphemism reform, which we created for it. Thank you. Thank you for acknowledging <laughs> The euphemism. <laughs> they were cuts. They were pure and simple cuts. And it was partly associated with the idea that people that used, uh, people that turned to EI were repeat offenders and needed to be reformed. It was the people, it was the people that needed to be reformed in the behavior, not the program. Um, and they did it. And they did it mostly on the backs of low paid workers and women. And they did it in the middle of a recession. <laughs> Before Reagan, we called these things automatic stabilizers and they were an important part of our economy. Yeah. And in fact, my last column for the Toronto Star is precisely on all of this. If anybody is interested in reading it, um, it is we have an opportunity to, again, reform, but in the sense of supporting people with an automatic stabilizer, because ladies and gentlemen, we are heading into a recession. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when it's coming to a neighborhood near you, somewhere in the next six months to a year, and we are not recession ready. We need to fix EI. But let me go back to the benefits part of it. You mentioned 10 paid sick days. Why isn't it everywhere? Like even the feds, they talked about it. They didn't do it, right? Like they campaigned on it two years into a pandemic. So, so why is that? I mean, let's cut right to the heart of this. The reason governments don't do that is because they are afraid that the business rhetoric is correct. And they are afraid that if mm. we start treating workers too generously, that we will hurt the economy. We will damage business investment. We will lower growth and we will hurt the country. Is that correct? There, you never change a system without somebody gaming it. So I'm going to improve EI. I'm going to make it more generous. I'm going to provide 10 paid sick days. It is going to help so many people hang on to their jobs and not make other people sick when they go in. It's going to help people move from one job to the other, but there will be people that abuse it. And you can always find these examples. So are they right? Sure, they can find examples of being right. Generally speaking, we need an automatic stabilizer, and particularly in a pandemic, we need to be able to permit people to stay at home so they don't make other people sick. So you have to look at not the, the, the retail level, you have to look at them like not the micro level, but the macro level of what that policy does. And of course, we always oversteer. That's what I'm old enough to know that policy wows back and forth. I mean, you, you were at the helm in a period of austerity. I mean, Canada kind of invented austerity in the 1990s. And the idea that we needed to deal with the deficit because 37 cents on every dollar we collected was going to debt payment, completely legitimate. How you do it is a different way, you know, a, a different story. But the idea that now deficits don't matter, you know, <laughs> for anybody in any political strike. You know, so, so things change. I'm having trouble adjusting to this world where, you know, <laughs> nobody in government even holds a news conference to announce something less than a billion dollars. Like if you don't have a billion dollars, you're not show, you're not even making an announcement anymore. I just don't. I have you know, the well, ninety five me has trouble adjusting to this world. Okay, isn't that like C D Howe on on stilts? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> 
a billion here, a billion there. Soon it starts adding up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure I answered your question, but um, I, I would like to say that this whole thrust towards pharmacare, dental care, mental health care, 10 paid sick days, reformed EI, 100% the right direction to be going in, in an era of a tight labor market. You do not want employers having to pay for these things. You want everybody to have these things so that they can be their best when they go to work. We're going to need all hands on deck. We've got not 10 years of the highest dependency ratio in Canada's history, which was the case when the baby boomers were born. We've got 20 to 30 years with half the rate of growth that we had in the 50s and 60s, because we were still coming off of the post-war um, reconstruction of a civilian economy and dealing with a baby boom. So we were building, building, building all over the place, right? It was mostly public building. It was mostly public infrastructure. Now we're going to have to do soft, like human public infrastructure, not physical public infrastructure to care for an aging society and to care for the people that are the smallest working age cohort we have seen in our history, propping up those who are too young, too old, and too sick to work. We're going to need all hands on deck. To do that, they have to have access to health care in every stripe, mental health care, dental health care, pharma care, child care, elder care. You know, like the care economy is going to get bigger. And if we provide it through the public sector, we spend less and we cover more people. So I, to me, it's a slam dunk argument, but it does require governments stepping up to the plate. And there's another inversion for you. So I said, we've gone from 40 years of chasing money to now we're going to have probably about 40 years of chasing people, finding enough people to do the job, to keep the economy growing. We've gone from 40 years of more market, less government. So now there is no question we need more government. And there will be a lot of diehards that say, as the care economy grows, this is an incredible opportunity to make profits. We have to resist that siren call. It will cost us more. It will cover fewer people. But it's part of a very old narrative of more market, less government. And so we need to be quite vigilant about how we apply it very effectively to long term care. Long-term care, child care, home care. Do you know, home care is riddled with apps. You can get, a, there's an app for that, you know. On-demand care is now a new form of gig work. Oh, when you asked me about, you know, is there something governments can do? The misclassification of people who are being deemed independent contractors who work on apps, who are in effect employees, has been proven over and over again in courts in Canada, in the UK, in Australia, in France, in Germany, around the world, Uber has lost every single, Uber and Lyft have lost every single court case that they've taken up to the Supreme Court. These people are employees. We need to change our laws and we need to make at every aren't our governments among the worst, Aren't our governments among the worst examples of not hiring new employees and only hiring people on contract? Yes. <laughs> yes, but you can say they're employee. Like there's a difference between a contract employee and a contract independent contractor who gets no coverage, right? right? And our point here is if you are misclassified, you're not paying into EI, you're not paying into CPP, you cannot exercise any labor rights, not minimum wages, not maximum overtime. You have no rights. Right. So we need to eliminate misclassification. One of the major reforms for EI is if the federal government introduced some legislation on mis misclassification, at least in its sector, so that you could not like and, and put the onus on the employer to show why this person is an independent contractor, not an employee, like actually have them prove it. How is this person an independent contractor? doesn't mean that there aren't any independent contractors, but it is used. So but they're commonly. not pizza delivery people, right? They're not pizza delivery people. Right? right. They're not the people that are taking you or the thing that you bought on Amazon. Like these are workers. Yeah. Right. And in Ontario, we have this terrible Orwellian world in which we get legislation called working for workers that creates a subclass of workers by law that have neither full protection under employment rights, uh, sorry, labor standards, um, nor are they 
fully independent contractors. This like will split the difference. It's like they're introducing legislation Uber is writing. Right. It's crazy making. Right. But let me put the small C conservative counter point. To sure. You, which is we've just blown the doors off of spending during COVID. You and I are talking about the mm. money that gets tossed around now. Uh, you have referenced the fact that nobody can find any real economic growth or growing productivity in our economy mm -hmm. near as, the, as far as the eye can see. Uh, aging population and all the associated costs that go along with that. You said we're likely to encounter a recession in the next year. Can we afford the society we want? Sure. Um, Canada is the ninth largest economy on the planet with a fraction of the population. Canada is one of only two countries that have the economic heft in terms of GDP and the bond rating uh, heft of being four star, triple A, right? Like it, there's only one other country like us and that's Germany. We can borrow as much as we want. We can spend as much as we want. We have to tax it or borrow it, one of the two, but we could be anything we want to be. Do you know, David, I was really struck by uh, the Del Duca fever that is sweeping some, some people in Ontario. And I think the reason for it is the platform is so freaking imaginative. We have stopped imagining what we want the future to be. But if we became imaginative, it doesn't mean that we're wasting money because we're spending it. It means we're changing, we're transforming what we're doing together versus what we're doing. I mean, again, another 40-year inversion. What have you done for me lately? Put money in my pocket. Uh, we just got over a billion dollars worth of cash in our pocket in Ontario for um, sticker. Uh, yeah. uh, geez, sticker license rating. renewals. For license license plate renewal. Yeah. yeah. What else could we have done with a billion dollars, right? The idea that we can actually do things collectively with our shared resources when we pool our money, we can do stuff that we couldn't possibly do on our own. That's what this, this platform is reminding us of in a way that the NTP aren't, in a way that certainly the Ontario government isn't. I was just really struck by Buckaride province-wide. Love it. Love, love, love this Stupid slogan is <laughs> transformational if it happens. I love the idea that, you know, they're saying that um, classrooms in the wake of pandemic, when Ontario's kids were the hardest hit in Canada in terms of school closures, classrooms will be capped at 20 people. So 20 students, and they'll have to hire 10,000 more teachers to make that happen. And if seniors in high school Want a grade 13, that's optionally available for them for free to do the catch up. These to me are transformational ideas in the wake of um, in the wake of a pandemic. And the other thing we were talking about right off the top, you know, like we've got over nine million people exiting the labor market at some point because they're boomers. We don't have I just nine recorded people. a curse. I just recorded a curse of politics this morning where Scott Reed and Jenny Byrne and I bemoaned the fact that the liberals seem obsessed with talking about their platform instead of attacking Ford. So now you're telling me how great the fucking platform is. You're making me feel bad. Oh, I'm sorry that I'm making you feel bad, but honestly, <laughs> these two things are day and night. Attacking Ford for his, you know, if, if I was a car, I'd vote for Ford. It's a car platform, <laughs> right? Uh, but I'm not a car. I'm a human. And I would like to talk about what I need and what my family needs. So I think there is, you know, debating them on their merits. It's like it's a car budget. It's a car platform. Um, I'm not a car. And cars <laughs> don't vote. Um, so I, anyway, I think my, my only point here is you said, can we pay for it? We're yeah. already awash in deficit. Well, if we bring in automatic stabilizers, we reduce the length and depth of a recession. We know that. We've known that since 1940 when we need to get recession ready. So we reduce the length and the depth of the next recession because it'll come. It'll either be because of climate change or it'll be because of the war in Ukraine or blah, blah, blah. There'll be another reason why there's a global meltdown and we are not ready for it. And we can't keep doing these ad hoc things. We need to fix it. So there's a way of fixing it. It doesn't cost that much more. And it makes a huge difference. And the other thing I want to point out to you is 
the idea of counterfactuals. What if we didn't do these things? How much smaller would our economy be? How much more unequal would it be? This is one of the, the themes that you raised. Look, I'm, I'm, I cut my teeth on inequality as a young economist working at the Social Planning Council of Toronto. How did I stumble into inequality? It was the wake of the 81-82 recession. We were hemorrhaging full-time jobs and replacing them with part-time jobs. Men were losing jobs and women were picking up shitty part-time service sector jobs because somebody needed to do some work to keep food on the table. And it was this polarization of working hours that drove inequality. It was this shift from a male-dominated single bread earner to we're scrambling to keep it going and the women are yeah. pitching in, that yeah. changed everything. That's what brought me into the world of inequality, and it's just gotten worse. But, you know, to, to the point of our conversation, you can make it better. We saw it in the budgets in the post-war period. Right in the wake of the 1973 oil price shock, the first one, um, we had a budget by, I think, John Turner in 1974, that addressed the poorest people that got hit by the oil price shock, that introduced tax cuts for the poorest people, that actually then said, we're burning up with deficit, but we are going to invest heavily in public infrastructure right now. It's a way of keeping the economy humming. And we had just expanded unemployment insurance in 1971. So yeah. like we were focused on, governments were focused on getting the foundations right. Not on, oh my God, can we afford it? It's like, what do we need to do to get ready for the next phase? It's our job because markets can't do that, but we can, especially at the federal level. The federal government should be not a blind banker, but the banker of all the big ticket items that we're doing across the country. ECE, the early learning and childcare, um, um, deals that were just signed across the country, to me it was like, this is a brand new fiscal federalism where the government is saying here, have more money, but by change, we'll pay for it. You decide what your priorities are, but you have to have priorities in these three areas, make things cheaper for parents, improve access, build more spaces and improve the quality of care. You, you decide how you're going to do those three things and we'll pay for it. Because right. we want to become equal partners in this thing that is going to be absolutely necessary for the labor market. To me, that's a new model of fiscal federalism that we have never seen before. Conditional funding, completely, like there's no cost obligation. There's no, there was no cost sharing obligation for the, parent, uh, for the provinces or territories. You just needed to sign on to, yeah, we're going to improve this, that, and the other. And document it. And to me, that seems like a really... Uh, potentially transformational way of building more housing, providing more pharma care or dental care. These are things that we can do. And the, the level of government that is most adept at raising resources and borrowing money should be bankrolling it and making sure it's the same across the country, not the same in terms of outcomes, because we're all starting from different places but that every province is making progress that wants to sign up for that money. The money's there if you want to sign, sign up for it, but you have to make progress. So I'm loving your energy. I'm loving your optimism. I want you to focus me. So give me, and I, everything's complex and there's a million good ideas, but if I want to make a difference on uh, the ability of, middle-class people to be middle-class and to continue to have the trappings of life that we've understood the middle-class to have in this country. What is the thing I should be advocating for? What's the most important fight we need to have? More public services of high quality, not paid for at point of use. It puts money in your pocket. It improves the quality of your life and your health and well-being and makes everybody the best they can possibly be. But we really need to get going on this real fast. Perfect. I mean, it's amazing how fast time can go by. We've been at this for about an hour and 10 minutes. And uh, it's been super fun. And I didn't realize it had been the time literally just flew by. 
Um, thank you for taking the time to do this. It was um, uh, a, sh a sharp diagnosis and assessment, but a hopeful and optimistic one. And you sound motivated to make change. Oh my God, David, I have never felt like positive change is more possible. Yeah, it can go sideways in a hurry, but we also have all the fixings in front of us to make things better for everybody. Great. Well, let's grab a coffee or something and figure out how we change the world together. Love to. Yeah, Love me, to. Me too. Thank you for coming on and taking the time. I'd like to thank everybody for listening or watching, and I'd also like to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsor, CN Rail. Um, Armin Yelnesian, brilliant interview, brilliant conversation. Thanks so much. Hurley Birdieites, we'll see you next week. Take care. Hurley, Hurley, Hurley.